Nine times a week, in cities scattered across the largest country on Earth, crowds of eager Soviet citizens gather to witness a timeless spectacle of magic and wonder. In the turbulent years following the Bolshevik Revolution, it was Lenin himself who nationalized the circus in 1919. Today, within the confines of a society that commands discipline and conformity, the Soviet government fosters an art form where imagination runs rampant and fantasy finds superb expression. on stage, on the road and in rehearsal, this is a world of spangles and sweat. The grind of constant practice, the glamour of the spotlight, the thrill of the unexpected, the artistry and excitement that exists inside the Soviet circus. understand our world, ourselves. Arts of the Soviet Union spring from roots deep in past centuries. In the land that inspired the music of Tchaikovsky, the plays of Chekhov and the Bolshoi Ballet, the circus is treated as an art form of equal importance. Russian circus evolved from the humble entertainments of tightrope walkers, jugglers and performing bears that once roamed the Russian countryside. Today, the Moscow Circus is but one of 70 permanent circus buildings in the USSR. More than 70 million Russians attend annually, paying less than $5 to leave their everyday cares behind and enter a world of enchantment. <laughs> Typically, no one sits more than 25 rows away from the single ring where Russian circus is always performed. The government is generous in what it spends to create a vibrant circus. Soyuz Gostsirk, the mammoth agency that administers it, employs 18,000 people, including 6,000 performing artists. Respected and admired, they enjoy incomes and social status greater than any other citizens, except top scientists and high government officials. Many circus buildings are state of the art. This one is equipped with interchangeable arena floors that can be switched from ice to water to solid floor within minutes.
acts are combined and recombined to form a hundred companies that are moved like chess pieces across the face of the nation. The artists have chosen the circus as a way of life. The arena is their home. Many of them were born into circus dynasties. Like their parents and grandparents, they grew up, married, and had their children here. From the day they make their professional entrance in the ring, they are guaranteed 20 years of employment and full retirement pay, even if they continue to perform. In a country where travel is restricted and artistic expression is limited, they are among the fortunate few. They will travel extensively in the course of their careers. The best may even perform abroad. Passionately committed to their art, each day, they stretch themselves to the limit in their efforts to entertain and please. While some came from the world of gymnastics and a few created their own acts, most began their careers in a quiet suburb of Moscow. Even now, hopeful youngsters with stars in their eyes follow the same path to the Moscow Circus School. Founded in 1927 by a group of performers who began teaching in abandoned circus wagons, it was the first state-run circus school in the world. The heart of the modern building is a circus ring. Each year, a thousand youngsters audition. Only 70 are accepted. Staffed primarily by retired performers, the school provides intense individual instruction. Young people from politically aligned nations often attend. This year, there are 40 foreign students, including 22 from Laos. The progress of each is constantly evaluated. Everyone is trained in a myriad of classic skills. Ballet, acrobatics, rope walking and clowning. Это вот известный кинорежиссёр, помните? Траубер, Козинцев, вот это мастерская Studies include subjects like history of the circus, in addition to the regular secondary school curriculum. Andrei Kirushin is the son of circus performers. He was born in Kiev because, he says, when the time came, my parents were there on tour. They encouraged him to enter the Moscow Circus School. Like the other hopefuls, he had to audition in juggling and acrobatics and pass a medical test. Andrei spends 20 hours a week rehearsing an act he and four other seniors formed last year. Its performance will fulfill one of their graduation requirements. With luck, it will launch their professional careers. In April, on a day designated as Subotnik, they set aside studies and rehearsals. Subotnik means work for the nation day. And all over the Soviet Union, workers and managers, students and teachers donate a Saturday to spruce up their workplaces. It's like a national spring cleaning. And these young people respectfully dust the statues and paintings of performers who attended the school before them. 
including the great clown, Oleg Popov. In June, they are part of the gala graduation performance. With a two-week run and paying audiences, it's the first taste of what their future lives will be like. receives the rhythmic applause that is the sign of a Soviet audience's highest approval. But they are still learning. The teaching and critiques continue. Yelena Dragolyova's instructor demonstrates the nuances of taking a bow advising her, do it more slowly, and give them a big smile at the end. From the time a performer prepares for his professional debut until he takes his last bow, everything he needs is provided. Here, at the Soviet artist's shop of the State Circus Organization, some 2,000 costumes are created every year. Now these students from the circus school don the regalia that will be the trademark of their future. Every summer, circus tents sprout up like mushrooms on the Russian landscape. Like masked Pied Pipers, the clown band lures the crowds to a tent in Moscow's Gorky Park. Today, their school friends, the jugglers, have come to say goodbye. The young men graduates must spend two years in the army. Yelena has decided to join with them. They will perform in a military entertainment group. Congratulations and good wishes are mingled with speculation on where the road of circus life will ultimately lead each of them. Voroshilovgrad was named for longtime military and political leader Kliment Voroshilov. It is an undistinguished industrial city in the Ukraine, a manufacturing center that foreign tourists virtually never visit. But it has its circus building and its circus hotel. And for a few weeks this bitter cold spring, it has a graduate of the Moscow Circus School who is one of the world's most famous living clowns, Oleg Popov. Popov's childhood was difficult. His father died in 1942, and Popov says he was half starved during the war years. At a memorial near Varashilovgrad, he pays tribute to the millions of Soviet citizens who lost their lives in World War II. The Russians call it the Great Patriotic War. Its memory is still kept very much alive in their hearts and minds. In the years since that cataclysmic event, Popov's life has changed dramatically. As a youth, he went in for sports, worked in the Pravda press room, and hung around the Moscow Circus School. In 1946, the school accepted him as a student. He made his professional debut at age 19 as a slack rope walker and juggler. He got his break in the best show business tradition, 
a clown became ill and Popov went on for him. His inventive nonsense and many talents quickly propelled him to stardom. Soon he was performing abroad. Newsweek wrote of one American appearance, the great Popov put the whole show into orbit. After nearly 40 years in the ring, he still travels the world, practices daily, and performs six nights a week, plus three matinees. He says, a clown's life is his art. In the exhilarating atmosphere of the arena, Popov is constantly innovating and perfecting. Yet he always makes time to share his expertise with a new generation of performers. Popov credits the work of Charlie Chaplin as his inspiration. Without elaborate makeup, he creates a character who is, he says, a simple, happy chap, perhaps a bit soft-hearted and lyrical. Ever the professional, he never stops warming up. career, showcasing his talents as a juggler and slack wire artist. As with all great performers, part of Popov's artistry is in making the difficult seem effortless. Of his stage persona, he says, I decided I would be Ivan the Fool, who in the end is no fool at all. At the same time, I would be a man of today, with a good dose of cunning, mischief and joy. The image would be understandable to the working man. As the show progresses, the roustabouts continually remove and set up props in the single ring. During these transitions, the clowns amuse and distract the audience. So Popov may appear 10 or 12 times in a single performance. still builds his own props and trains his performing animals. In this sketch, a clever dog outsmarts itself and passes out from too much picnic wine. At intermission, Popov joins the audience in the foyer for a personal appearance, delighting young fans 
as he may have once thrilled their parents. His humble identification with the masses and his importance as an ambassador of goodwill abroad have rewarded Popov with benefits enjoyed by few Russians. A salary, several times that of the ordinary performer, handsome living quarters in Moscow, and one of the country houses permitted only to the Soviet elite. <laughs> Married to a performer, father of a retired performer, Popov could have retired years ago, but he prefers to keep working. What happens, he says, is that a fine speck of sawdust enters your bloodstream. Once you are infected, it is for life. Popov has been called a genius of the art of whimsy. In one of his favorite sketches, he and his assistant touch on everyone's experience to create laughter from pain and fear. Popov's inspired clowning has earned him one of his country's highest awards, People's Artist of the USSR. But it is the work itself on which he thrives. Without jokes, he says, it would be impossible to live in this world. In a stark stretch of desert, just a few miles from the mountains that border Iran, lie the ruins of Nisa, capital of ancient Parthia. Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Tamerlane, and Arab warriors all left their imprint on this landscape. Tsarist troops established a Russian outpost nearby in 1881. Since 1924, when the Turkmen Soviet Socialist Republic was formed, this Central Asian state has been part of the Soviet Union. Even today, an ancient aura clings to the marketplaces where Turkmenian people sell the wares that have made them famous for hundreds of years. Torrid spring day, the youngsters of Ashkabad, the modern capital, gather for a circus parade, the first ever held here. This remote outpost boasts the newest circus building in the nation. Melodies whose origins echo through centuries of Central Asian history enliven the festivities. Costumed youngsters perform Turkmenian dances. In the audience, traditional clothing is accented by red scarves that identify young pioneers, members of a communist youth organization. 
exotic blend of European street fair, American circus parade, Turkmenian music, and Russian circus explodes in exuberant entertainment. Backstage, a man who was brought up in a house next to a circus tent and defied his family to join the circus prepares for the Saturday matinee. His name is Mikhail Bagdasarov. He worked his way up from roustabout to star animal trainer. His fondest dream is that his son, Artur, will follow in his footsteps. The boy travels with him, changing schools eight to 12 times a year. At age nine, this is already his world. Bagdasarov wants Artur to enter circus school so that in his words, he'll really be an all around performer, not just a beast tamer like me. Ну, скажи, пожалуйста, сынок, если бы ты бы, предположим, был бы на этой рекламе, было бы все нормально, хорошо было бы, а? But when asked if he can see himself among the tigers on his father's poster, Artur is quick to say yes. Да. Серьезно? Да? Вместо тигра, что ли? Нет. А? Как нет? Working with unpredictable big cats, Bagdasarov comes face to face with danger every day. I am in love with the circus, he says. And for a man who is in love, it's difficult for him to explain why. His spirited act presents trained tigers, lions, leopards, and American mountain lions. He handles them all with skill and obvious pleasure. Although each performance lasts only minutes, caring for two dozen animals requires constant attention. In the oppressive heat, the water both cools the tigers and cleans their cages. Like a shadow, Artur stays near his father, learning all he can. But until now, Bagdasarov has not allowed the boy into the arena. Bagdasarov has been severely injured. His head was mauled, his throat torn, his little finger bitten off, and he's had what he calls trifling injuries so many times he's lost count. Outside the cage, his assistants are always ready to distract the animals should danger threaten again. Now, for the first time, he invites Artur into the ring. He asks the boy if he is frightened. If he is ready to try. First, he instructs his son in the use of the whip. It will not be used on the animals. Its sound is an effective form of control. Uh, 
When Atu has become accustomed to being in the ring, young tigers are released. Bagdasarov believes that a year and a half is the best age for a tiger's contact with its trainer to begin. Gently, he encourages the boy to touch the tiger, beginning the process of mutual trust. Bagdasarov says, I need to help my son, so I'll always be in the circus. I guess till the last beat of my heart, I'll be a circus man. So too, he hopes, will Artur. Arriving at the train station in Minsk, the capital of Belarusia, Alexander Frisch unpacks his prop box. Taking his cue from the days when performers and animals paraded to the circus grounds, he provides onlookers with a preview of his act. Frisch has worked in Minsk before. He knows its streets well. He will join a troupe that is already performing in the elegant circus building. For each new engagement, he must train an assistant to work with him in the arena. Frisch spends hours with the musicians and technicians so the puzzle pieces of the act will fit together perfectly. One of the reasons Frisch is so fond of the circus is because it gives him the opportunity to work with children. Here at the sports palace of the Railway Station Workers' Union, local youngsters study circus arts. Frisch gives his time to coach them. Вперед перед собой и медленно, 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 и и сразу улыбка должна быть. He demonstrates how comedy can be found anywhere, even in a hat. And the youngsters take pride in showing him a lavish number they have assembled for amateur performances.
For his opening day at the circus, Frisch has invited some of the promising youngsters from the sports palace to join him backstage. Bubbling with ambition to become professionals, these young performers are offered their first peek at circus life behind the scenes. You know that in the beginning you will be able to get to a grim or you will be able to get to someone similar. Do you like Paul Lund? Frisch explains that in preparation and performance, even the tiniest details make a difference. Все, все в пудре, все зеркало, ничего не видно. Они делают маленькую такую, маленькую, маленькую, они все не вытирают. И только пятнышко такое, пальцем. И все, и видно там свой, и достаточно. Фриш says his heart has been in the circus from the day his father picked up three potatoes in their kitchen and started to juggle. He dreamed of having any job in the circus. When he became a roustabout, Frisch carried his broom in a trombone cover, pretending he was already a performer. Alexander Frisch! The inspiration for his act came from a photograph he saw of a Czechoslovakian performer juggling boxes. Frisch taught himself to do it, retreating to the forest because his neighbors couldn't stand the noise of his rehearsal. Once, when he was on tour in Tokyo, some of the boxes fell from the stage into the audience. The Japanese children rushed to pick them up for him. Since then, the participation of children has been a hallmark of his act. <laughs> It's essential that kids see for themselves there is no secret here, he explains. These are just plain kindergarten blocks without any magnets or devices. I like what I'm doing, Fish says. When there is an arena and you are under the circus dome with the audience above you, well, I'd never change that. Traveling through the dense birch forests of the western Ukraine, Vilyan Galovka, leader of a troop of aerialists called the Cranes, his mother-in-law and his wife Yelena are totally absorbed in the Galovka's new baby. The four-month-old is traveling with the Galovkas to their first circus assignment since his birth. Their world will be different now. <laughs> Members of the troop and their families are on board for the 21-hour trip from Moscow. 
part of the endless odyssey that defines life in the surface. It seems Lena is already preparing young Willian for a career as an aerialist. Their journey terminates in the city of Lvov. Part of the Soviet Union since 1945, the city is the traditional economic and cultural capital of the western Ukraine. For 600 years, Lvov was the scene of strife between warring powers and opposing religions. Yet somehow the monuments and buildings left by each nation and era combined to create a beautiful city that looks like the setting for a European operetta. Villian began his circus career in this city. Now he introduces his wife to its charming old market square. The cranes travel with nearly a ton of equipment necessary for their act. Setting it up is laborious and exacting. A circus representative checks x-rays of the machinery for signs of metal fatigue. The lives of 10 aerialists are at stake. The performers themselves, their four technicians and an engineer cooperate in setting up the equipment. The winch, which travels with them, is key to the execution of their act. After eight hours of intense preparation, the machinery is tested. With everything functioning properly, the week's rehearsal period they are allowed may begin. But now there's a moment to relax. <laughs> <laughs> Surrounded by the warmth of his extended family, this toddler dares his first steps towards what may be his future. The cranes arrived in Lvov just before May Day, the day when socialist workers worldwide demonstrate their solidarity. The members of the cranes participate in the life of the community wherever they are. A celebration like this one is a link that unites them with the local people as well as with the nation. For the circus performers, hotels provided by the government are home for most of the year. Because of the baby and Lena's mother, the Golovkas are allowed two rooms in the arena hotel adjoining the circus. Lena is entitled to 18 months of maternity leave. But she says, I just can't imagine sitting at home. Of course, my home and the family are important, but my work is my work, and I want to do it well. Of course. Of course. Yeah. 
Still, her mother will be leaving soon, and the circus provides for childcare only after a baby is a year old. Lena hopes to work out something with other young circus mothers. Villian's father was an aerialist. He says he was baptized by being thrown on a trampoline. Like his father, Villian studied at the Moscow Circus School. He spent more than a year searching for a woman for the act. Then Lena, a gymnast who dreamed of joining the circus, auditioned. The crane's name alludes to the symbolism of the birds in a Russian song about World War II. On Victory Day, as they pay tribute to the fallen, its lyrics resound in their minds. It seems to me sometimes that the soldiers were never laid to rest in the ground that they belonged in, but turned into white, graceful cranes. Even today, they pass high overhead. <laughs> Villian and a producer worked for five years to develop the crane's unique act. Dramatic, poetic, it tells a story as a dance would, using the net as a stage. more than athletic prowess. To achieve the artistic level, he says, you must wake up the soul of the person. All people have a soul, but in some people it is sleeping. When a performer is doing some tricks in the arena, if his soul is sleeping, he is no artist. After their arrival, it's time for the opening performance. As showtime approaches, the atmosphere crackles with excitement. Vilyana <laughs> joined the Crane's act seven years ago. I never expected that I'd be Vilyana's wife, she says. But time passed and my views changed a bit. We understood that we must always be together. Together? They head for the arena that means so much to them both. The warning bell signals the last few moments for mental and physical preparation. <laughs> As their act opens, the cranes are flying in triangle formation.
least souls of the soldiers, transfigured into cranes, ascend to the heavens. Is one of the wounded. She is helped skyward by other cranes. Crane's commitment, dedication, and preparation are rewarded. For the Cranes, a lifetime of artistic gratification stretches before them. Even now, another generation of young performers enters the professional arena. In this enchanted circle, their strong bodies are always in control. Wild beasts are our friends. Over! And joy and laughter prevail. Practitioners of an ancient and universal art, these extraordinary artists allow the ordinary mortal escape from life's workaday realities. Throughout the republics of the Soviet Union and the world, the language they speak is understood without words, as beauty, rhythm, and skill bridge the gap of generations, politics, and nationalities. gentlemen, boys and girls, these are the talented performers who have revealed to you the magic 
inside the Soviet circus. Next Monday at 8 p.m., be sure to watch Mysteries of Mankind, our next National Geographic special on KBDI. better understand our world, ourselves, and our future. This program was made possible by the people of Chevron. Chevron, giving thought to television. Additional funding.